and we're back for the second paper of the evening. We just did the knowledge of norm blaming, which was a very nice but very short paper. And so let's uh, continue on with the uh, analysis because why the heck not? Um, let's see, I did a bunch of these already. But I mean, since I'm already here and you know, what was it? I did this Mark Jago, did I? Yeah, I did mark this Mark Jago, it was good. There's another one here by him, I'll do if I see it again. Cause uh, I was like, at one point I was like, I already did one by him, but why not just do, do some more. Um, robbers kick pockets average mutual firmness. I looked at this, maybe it's up by now. Please be available. No, you stink. Shucks. Classless. Did I do this one already? I don't even know. Well, I can't do it, so it doesn't matter. Hmm. Actually, wait a sec. Right, just take open that up, see if it's available. Schellenberg's capacitism. Alex Byrne. This available, not obviously, and this available. There we go. So your paper gets read. Because it's here. Capacitism. I have no idea what that is, but we're going to find out. And if you're joining me live, you can grab the paper by typing exclamation point paper in the chat box. Please join me live. I like having people in the chat. It's fun. So please ask a question if you have one and I will try to answer it. There's no reason to think that I will have anything smart to say though. <laughs> Sadly enough. Sometimes I do, sometimes I do not. Uh... Cool. Okay, here we go. Second short paper of the evening. Very happy to have have it. Schellenberg's capacitism. The universe, the unity of perception offers a grand synoptic vision of how perception, consciousness, and knowledge fit together. It is a remarkable achievement. A short comment can only address fragments of Schellenberg's picture. Naturally, I will look for weak spots. Um, I guess, I, uh, what would a cheerleader paper look like? I mean, that's one of the problems with philosophy. There's no cheer. well, there's sometimes there's cheerleaders. But uh, I don't know what, it, uh, everyone's always criticizing in philosophy. I have no idea. The key idea of the book, Schellenberg explains, is that perception is constituted by employing perceptual capacities. For example, the capacity to discriminate and single out instances of red from instances of, of blue. I will start by discussing some issues raised by the underlying passages. So we got constituted, discriminate, single out, and instances of blue are the ones that the author underlined, not Schellenberg. Then segue into a, an, exa an examination of particularity argument presented in the first chapter. Finally, I will raise a general worry about capacitism. There is an enormous amount of valuable material in the unit of perception that will go unmentioned. But Excuse me. But before all that, a brief note on Schellenberg's starting point. What are perceptual systems good for? Why do animals have them? A very appealing answer is that animals have them because perceptual systems supply useful information, more exactly, useful knowledge about the external and internal environment. Even a philosopher who thinks that human perception is somehow fundamentally different from that of animals can endorse a version of this point. After all, one of McDowell's books is Perception as a Capacity for Knowledge. No doubt, the capacity to single out and discriminate particulars is important for gaining knowledge, but why put that capacity front and center as opposed to the capacity to know? Alright, let's find out. Discrimination and singling out. This is how Schellenberg explains a pertinent notion of discrimination. When we perceptually discriminate alpha from beta, we discriminate an actual mind-independent particular alpha to which we are perceptually and perceptually related to, from a distinct actual mind independent 
particular beta to which we are perceptually related. It is unclear how someone could perceptually aware could be uh, perceptually aware of, say, a leaf without registering how it differs in at least one respect from its surround. More generally, it is unclear how one could be perceptually aware of a particular without registering how it differs in at least one respect. Wait. A leaf, or more than how one could be of so a particular without registering how it, it it differs at least one respect from its surround. The basic level of employing perceptual capacities is to discriminate one particular from another, where this discrimination is understood as registering their differences. And here is her account of singling out. Singling out a particular can be understood as a proto-conceptual analog of referring to a particular. Non-rational animals and infants as young as four months can perceptually single out particulars in their environment, yet on at least some notions of reference they do not have the capacity to refer. So we've got a singling out, non, a non-referential singling out, and it's the singling out of uh, particulars that makes a big difference here, it looks like. So in what we when we perceive some d difference, we are perceiving some particular. Okay. How are discrimination and singling out related? It is clear that Schellenberg thinks that perceptually singling out alpha requires discriminating alpha from some particular beta, but discriminating alpha from beta does not seem to require singling out alpha. Perceiving an instance of red is distinct from perceiving an instance of blue. Both cases may involve discriminating red from blue, but in the former case, an instance of red is singled out, while in the latter case, an instance of blue is singled out. Yeah, because um, it could be... We might think they're similar because one's a color, they're both colors, but well, I mean, one could be a squirrel. We're just calling it a particular uh, a particular instance of squirrel is, different, is distinct from perceiving an instance of blue. And so that would be uh, less likely to be cause confusion. But there are two different things, red and blue. At least in the particular case. I mean, you, if you have two different particulars, but as a color, of course, they're not so different. But as a particular, then they are. Suppose one discriminates an instance of red from its instance of blue and singles out the instance of blue, but not the instance of red. Then one is perceptually related to both instances. All right, terminology. Does one also perceive both instances? No, because perceiving alpha requires discriminating and singling out alpha. The dis explanation of singling out alpha suggests that it amounts to attending to A, but then Schellenberg could not have said that perceiving alpha requires singling it out, since one can perceive something without attending to it. Either singling out adds something to discriminate, discrimin Add something to discrimination, in which case it is doubtfully a constitutive component of perception, or else it adds nothing, in which case it can be deleted. Um, yeah, I mean, depends on how you're slicing things up. What does it mean to be a constitutive component of perception? I mean, I guess you'd have to know the whole theory to understand what a constitutive component of perception actually comes down to. Um, singling out might, I mean, it's like either it is just part of the general framework and then it shouldn't make any difference or else it, and so it's part of the general framework and adds nothing in which case you could ignore because it it's always there or it adds something. Um, but then if it's adding something, then it's actually, you're doing something else and it's not actually what you're talking about in perception. So you, you should throw it out. This is a little bit of a. I find this a little difficult. Uh, a lot of stuff is going on in perception, and just having this sort of argument right here, um, it, I mean, it's it's a legit argument. There's no problem with it, but it, it it's forcing like uh, one like two different options, and I'm not sure they're the only two options um, for that sort of thing. So, but it's a different sort of problem. Okay, property instances. We perceive objects like pigs and lemons in events like a pig's grunt or a lemon's crushing. Schellenberg's, Schellenberg thinks we also perceive other sorts of particular property instances. The relevant particulars perceived can be objects, events, or property instances in our environment. I'll assume, a, assume an Aristotelian view on which properties are understood in terms of their instances. Hence, I will assume that we perceive property instances. These property instances, instances could be, but need not be, understood as tropes. Regardless of whether or not property instances are understood to be tropes, they are particulars and not universals. Okay, so they're sort of like uh, tokens of a type or a trope, as it were. As Schellenberg, of course, recognizes, it is controversial whether there are any property instances or tropes if these are different. 
A red tomato falls from the table and messily explodes on the floor. There is an object, the tomato, and some events. The tomatoes fall, the tomato explosion. Yeah, the tomatoes do explode, don't they? They are, there are some properties or universals, redness falling, making a splat, and so a splat sound, and so on. There are some facts involved in these previous items, the fact that the tomato is red, for instance. Schellenberg has no issue with any of these, but she thinks there are some other items, like the particular instance of redness qualifying the tomato. That might seem like overkill. What do property instances do that, do that objects, events, and properties and facts don't? One thing they do, Schellenberg argues, is causally affect us. So when we perceive, say, the shape of the cup in front of us, that shape must be causally efficacious, otherwise we could not perceive it. Um, really? Okay. Thus, given plausible assumptions about causation, the shape of the cup must be concrete, spatio-temporal, particular, rather than universal. After all, universals are neither spatio-temporally located nor causally efficacious. Granted, for the sake of argument, that universals are not causally efficacious, and that particular property instances are. Here's an option that Schellenberg needs to rule out for her argument to work. We perceive the, the cup's shape, understood as universal, something shared with other cups, because we are causally affected by a particular instance of that shape, the one qualifying the cup in front of us. But we do not perceive this particular property instance. The only particular we perceive is the cup. Okay. And that option is hardly unattractive because it is far from clear that we do perceive property instances. Here are some things, some particulars. So we got black triangle, we got the box, and we got a white triangle uh, with the black outline. How many are there? Oh, well, I don't know. How many ways can we slice this up? Lots. I mean, there's a bunch of pixels on the screen at the moment. The answer your visual system apparently gives is three. Well, it could be like... Uh, I mean, there's the issue, of course, with things. You got prompted to say things to begin with, so it's not just a group of shapes, because that one it would be one group of shapes. And then you've got, like, different sorts of things, and like I said, there's a lot of pixels. So, I don't know how many things there are, but we are definitely expected to answer three here. <laughs> At least in the sense that one can immediately tell by looking that there are three particulars, a black triangle, a white square, and a white triangle. Again, this is not a black, a white, a white square. It's a outline of a square in black on white, perhaps, maybe. And I didn't invert the screen. Like you can put a background on it that wouldn't be the color. But so yeah, I don't know. But on the property instance ontology, there are many more particulars than that. There is the instance of triangularity on the left, and another instance of triangularity on the right. There is an instance of whiteness on the right, and another instance of whiteness in the middle, and so on. On Schellenberg's view, you see and so discriminate and single out all these instances. Yeah, it does seem to be multiplying objects to give uh, this property instance sort of thing. And uh, as Occam said, don't do that. But maybe it's a good idea here. I don't know. If property instances are so important to a perception, one might expect perceptual science to make use of them, but it doesn't. I, you don't, you know, going, you can do experimental philosophy, but I wouldn't just hand wave at, I mean, I don't hand wave at what scientists do to get philosophical um, evidence. It's a, you can do it, but like you have to do it specific. Like this one sense isn't going to doesn't convince me of anything. There was plenty of talk about objects and their perceptible features, but none about, at all about property instances. Yeah, but you see, there might be a semantic issue here. They might be talking about property instances in some other way. So, it's like, you can't just, uh, whatever. And even if we do perceive property instances, perceptual systems treat them very differently from particular objects and events. There's no evident motivation for lumping all these together. That may be the case. That's okay. Okay. Yeah, I apologize for being a curmudgeon. Consti constitution and the particularity argument. Schellenberg gives this explanation of constitution. A is constituted by B, if and only if A is grounded in B, or ground is understood as a relation that can hold between entities, such as mental states and material mind-independent particulars, and not just between propositions. So when I say that A is constituted by B, I mean that A is at least partially grounded in B without B necessarily being a material component of A. With the account of constitution in hand, let's now turn to Schellenberg's argument that for the particularity thesis, 
that a subject's perceptual state is constituted by particulars perceived. Suppose Kim sees cup one and that her perceptual state is perceptual state MK is constituted by cup one. Okay, so we've got perceptual state MK in a cup one. Does the existence of MK entail the existence of cup one? As philosophers of perception would typically understand this question, the answer is yes. And I think th that is Schellenberg's answer as well. Moreover, oh, thank you, five circles. Moreover, the issue of entailment is, re is really what divides particularists from the generalist. Bearing that in mind, here's the particular argument. See, unfortunately, I don't know what the generalist is. We were only talking about particulars particularists at the moment. So let's find out. One, if a subject S perceives particular alpha, then S discriminates and singles out alpha as a consequence of being perceptually related to alpha. Two, if S discriminates and singles out alpha as a consequence of being perceptually related to alpha, then S's perceptual state M brought about by being perceptually related to alpha is constituted by discriminate, discriminating and singling out alpha. Okay, so if they, if they do it, and then here's what is going on. Okay. If S's perceptual state M brought about by being perceptually related to alpha is constituted by discriminating and singling out alpha, then S's perceptual state M brought about by perceptually related to alpha is constituted by alpha. C, well, this conclusion, I guess. If S perceives alpha, then S's perceptual state M brought about being perceptually related to A is constituted by alpha, not A, alpha. Okay, the second premise of the particular argument Okay, so yeah, this is just showing that uh, how your mental state, perceptual state M, relates to something in the world alpha. The second premise of the particularity argument, Schellenberg says, is supported by the following general principle. If a subject is in a mental state in virtue of engaging in a mental activity, then that mental state is constituted at least in part by that mental activity. We can make the connection between GP and premise 2 even clearer by slightly reformulating the latter. 2 star. If S discriminates and singles out alpha, she is in a perceptual mental state M in virtue of this mental activity, then M is constituted by discriminating and singling out alpha. And 2 plainly follows from GP, also slightly reformulated. If S is in a mental state in virtue of engaging in mental activity, then that mental state is constituted by that mental activity. Okay, so what? All right, so now recall Schellenberg's account of constitution. A is constituted by B, if and only if A is grounded in B. We can then write GP as follows, GP star. If S is in a mental state in virtue of engaging in a mental activity, then that mental activity is grounded in that mental activity. Okay, grounded in is, a, is terminologically from high, yeah, grounded, there's a lot of big words over here, and this is a, Grounded in is terminologically from high church metaphysics. What does it mean? It is usually taken to have an equivalent formulation in terms of the more ordinary sounding in virtue of. X is grounded in Y if and only if obtains of exist blah 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 in virtue of Y obtaining existing blah blah blah. The problem is that GP is not that GP is false, quite the contrary. It is now looking like a tautology as is premise two. If S discriminates and singles out alpha in virtue of this mental activity she is in perceptual state M, then M is constituted by discriminating and singling out. Yeah, so basically, this is sort of restating this in virtue of stuff uh, by saying constituted. So constituted and virtue of are sort of looking very much the same and therefore it's a by doing these uh, sort of substitutions, the author has shown that like nothing actually is happening here. There's no uh, explanation going on. Okay, this is not yet to give an objection to the partic particularity argument, but it does allow for some simplification. A shorter version of the argument can I can suggest to be put as follows. One star, if S perceives alpha, then S discriminates and singles out alpha. She is in a perceptual state M in virtue of discriminating and singling out alpha. Three, we can just skip two, I guess two doesn't matter. Or at least it's two stars up here. Three star, if S is in perceptual state M in virtue of discriminating and singling out alpha, then S's perceptual state M is constituted by alpha. And conclusion, if S perceives alpha, then S's perceptual state M is constituted by alpha. Okay, so you got there just faster. The generalist Schellenberg's opponent denies C. He thinks that someone could be in perceptual state M by perceiving beta a particular qualitatively identical 
a particular qualitatively identical to alpha, even in a ca counterfactual scenario in which alpha does not exist. He may say, for instance, that all that is required to be in M is for one's brain to be intrinsic state B. The opponent thus denies that seeing alpha is a perceptual state, strictly speaking. Okay. Should the generalist be worried by the particularity argument? Despite siding with Schellenberg's particular, particularism, I do not think so. The generalist can agree with Schellenberg that perceiving alpha requires discriminating, discriminating and singling it out, but he can, for all Schellenberg has said, fairly deny that S is in perceptual state M in virtue of discriminating and singling out alpha. On his view, S is in M in virtue of having a brain in intrinsic state B. Okay, so you can be in the mental state of uh, singling stuff out without actually having anything in the world. <laughs> so I guess this is like the hallucination argument. You could be hallucinating and um, say that, you know, you can be in this mental state of thinking you're uh, p picking something out, but there's no alpha there to be picking out, so it's only the mental state. And so it's like um, there's like a null case here that the author is saying Schellenberg has sort of missed. So if you can just have the brain state, you don't actually need to have the alpha um, that con that Schellenberg is saying is the brain state is constituted by. So if there is, so if there's no alpha, you can still do the brain state B. Yeah. Okay. A general worry about capacitism. The basic capacitist idea is that perception is constituted by employing perceptual capacities to discriminate and single out objects, more generally particulars. In the specific, specific case of vision, seeing an object is constituted by successfully employing the visual capacity to discriminate and single out objects. Now arguably visually discriminating and singling out X amounts to seeing X. As Dresky puts it, S sees sub n d is equal to d is visually differentiated from its immediate environment by s. If this is right, the basic idea can be put more simply. Seeing an object is constituted by successfully employing the visual capacity to see objects. This is not at all trivial. Well, none of this stuff is trivial, but okay. In fact, the general equation of effing is like using p. Effing and peeing just should not be a... We shouldn't be using these letters in, like, in busted uh yeah just effing all right let it go with successfully employing the capacity to f <laughs> is incorrect in fact the general equation of effing with successfully employing the capacity to f is incorrect i have no capacity to hit the bullseye but i might hit it by a fluke no then you have a capacity to hit it the fluke is the capacity i don't know what that means like i, I completely um, it means, ex I'm not exactly sure what, if we have a semantic difference by what is meant by capacity there. Like, you have a capacity to hit it, like, maybe you need to practice more. But if you hit it by fluke, I mean, it's like you, you've just defined yourself out of the problem. By saying that y the fluke was not a capacity. What do you mean? Well, why not? I don't quite, uh, assume that. You having a fluke, a uh, good shot, is um, lacking a capacity. Now, now let's say, could you win a, a competition, a shooting competition, by a fluke? Um, it does happen. Did you have the capacity to win it? I mean, if you, it's like one of those, like the lottery example. You have to be in it to win it, as the old commercial used to say. But I mean, are you going to win it? Yeah, probably not. But it, like a fluke. But just being in it is, in some sense like the necessary conditions to win it. It's not sufficient, but then we're getting into like details here. Anyway, can we do the same for seeing an object? Here's an example from Lewis, the loose wire. A prosthetic eye has a loose wire. Mostly it flops around and when it does, when, when it does the eye malfunctions and the subject's visual experience con consists of splotches unrelated to the scene before the eyes. But sometimes it touches the contact it ought to be mobbed into and as long as it does, the eye functions perfectly and the subject sees. Whether he sees has nothing to do with whether the wire touches the contact often or seldom or only this once. Okay. 
So Lewis is actually concerned with seeing the intransitive sense, not seeing as such and such a particular thing. But the example works just as well for both. We can add more loose wires and make it even clearer that the subject with a in-practice non-functional prosthetic eye lacks the capacity to see objects in any useful sense of capacity. Yet an improbable coincidence joining many of the loose wires results in the subjects fleetingly seeing a tomato. Um, so is this like a sore rights where you keep taking away the chance of being able to see until we no longer think that it is a capacity anymore and then it happens by some completely improbable situation that all the uh, wires touch really just at just the right time. Um, I don't know how effective this sort of argument is because it's one thing to like, yeah, there's a, well, I guess the general argument here is right. Like capacitism then is subject to a sore rights argument that you don't actually know what it constitutes to have a capacity. And for that, yeah, so in that case, this does work. Uh, all right, so if that's where we're going, I think the author is right. I'm this author, not the capacitist. This is one reason to be skeptical of capacitism, but there is every reason for philosophers with an interest in mind or epistemology to read the unity of perception. Oh, okay, so that was the uh, whole point. It's that we can, you can sore rights the uh, theory here, that you don't actually have the ability to um, define capacitism in a reasonable way, and therefore it's um, ad hoc. I guess is the uh, criticism in the end. All right. Okay. So we've got this perceptual state that you think could just happen out of dumb luck by a hallucination. Like you could hallucinate seeing your tomato or you could actually see it. Now, if you hallucinate it, then you have the qualitatively identical to alpha state of mind of seeing the, like seeing the tomato and so you don't actually need to have the tomato there to have the particularity and then secondly this is a general you can generalize this to being a general sore rights problem where all sorts of things could be going wrong and then it becomes harder and harder to say you have any capacity whatsoever all right so i would have appreciated the transition here the segue to go a little bit uh smoother but i understand the thrust of the argument so was, uh, this is an okay essay um i'm not in love with the rhetoric really but other than that it's all right um yeah so we've got so that's kind of uh what this is uh going on here you've got this uh capacitive perceptual theory based on capacitism and basically two arguments one that you can have the capacitism with no actual uh, worldly objects because it uh, makes some uh, relies on some metaphysics that are dodgy at least according to this author they're dodgy and that's all right you can have like all right so you didn't like that person's metaphysics it's dodgy metaphysics according to author fine in it it sort of like uh, depends on your, your metaphysical stance, how much you think uh, they're dodgy or they're actually worth defending. And then the author then generalized to show that if you have dodgy metaphysics, you can sore rights the whole thing so that you don't actually know if capacitism makes any sense anymore. Um, okay, that's uh, reasonable. And I guess uh, that's it for now. I hope everyone has a good night. Stay safe. And uh, thanks for people who showed up in chat. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I'll be back tomorrow, I guess, because there's nowhere to go and there's nothing to do. And our lovely governor just closed down New York till at least May 15th. So we are all closed for basically another month. I hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Bye-bye. Good night.